and we'll get started. So a couple of really, really minor things. And I want to remind people because sometimes we have the right idea and worse is we get the right final answer and that justifies everything we said. And I, that one always makes me laugh. See, I used to teach remedial algebra and I would do problems where they had to multiply things with negatives. And I'd make it really small. I'd be like, you know, negative one to a power times negative two, you know, things where you, the number was correct. And really all it came down to was counting the signs. And I'd have students who'd do three, four steps. Every single step was wrong, but they'd get the right final answer because they made it exactly an even number of errors on their negative signs. <laughs> It'd be like a two-step problem. And I'd have people with four negative sign errors, but they got the right answer because they made four errors. Now, had they only made three errors, they would have got the wrong answer. And they'd say, well, obviously my work justifies my answer. It doesn't work that way. A implies B does not mean B implies A, period. So a right answer does not mean what preceded it is even relevant. It's the other way around. What precedes it has to be flawless. So there's a couple of little things I want to remind people of. For example, if A over B equals C, then A equals BC. This is an absolute. There is no exception to this statement mathematically, but we violate this one all the time. I'm trying to get rid of the thumbnail here. There we go. We violate this one all the time. And I'll give you a simple example. When evaluating a limit, I can evaluate this. There's no discontinuity. There's nothing weird going on. This limit is nine. But if I said, what about, let's say, um, keep it simple, one like this. I cannot evaluate this one because it's the indeterminate form zero over zero, but I can factor and cancel. And I know algebraically, this quantity is equal to this quantity for all real numbers except three because three is not in the domain. The quantities are not equal, but their limits are because you're never actually at three. So now as I take the limit as X approaches three, we know that's one sixth. We all know how to do that one. We have no doubt about that one. Where we get in trouble is not the removable discontinuities. Where we get in trouble is the infinities and the asymptotic discontinuities. Those are the ones that trouble us the most. Now, this is actually a theorem that I show. The limit as X goes to zero I'm sorry, as x goes to zero, sorry, as x goes to infinity of one over x is zero. And if you look at it from a graphing point of view, this is what we define, of course, as a transient term. And as x gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the difference between one over x and zero is approaching zero. The limit is zero. But here's what I'm getting people telling me. They're telling me the limit as x goes to infinity of one over x is one over infinity, which is zero. Okay, uh, you couldn't get any wronger. That's a word, wronger. Um, I, I just lost all credibility with a statement like that. That's an absurdly terrible, terrible answer. And I'm gonna show you why. Say A is any constant. Remember that statement right there? If this was true, then one equals infinity times zero is absolutely true. This is an identity if this is true. The problem is that's an identity if this is true, which now means one equals A for all real numbers. A is an absolute true identity. This is absolute. There's no gray areas. There's no, oh, I can only do this sometimes. This statement is either absolutely true or it's absolutely false. This statement's absolutely true or it's absolutely false. This statement's absolutely true or it's absolutely false. We know this is an utterly absurd statement because this is an utterly absurd statement. Infinity is not a constant. And if it shows up in an algebraic statement, it doesn't really matter what I write next. It's not true because that is not true. But we're getting into this really bad habit of putting infinities into the algebra. That's dangerous. If I asked you to take the limit as X goes to infinity of the cosine of X, we know this limit does not exist. But the problem is, is that we are actually physically writing, this is the cosine of infinity and then following. Well, 
if I can say this, then I am done because I just wrote the cosine of a single value, which would be the answer, but this limit does not exist. And I can't insert an infinity into the exposition that has no meaning mathematically. My result can be infinity, but my result actually is a DNE, but it's not that. Ah, so we're getting in trouble because we're trying to evaluate at infinity as if infinity was a place I could get to. I'm going to give you, we love absolutes of math. If I can use infinity to evaluate a limit, then the moment I plug in the infinity, I'm done. There's no simplification. I'm done. Because you can't get another value if you put an infinity into a mathematical statement. See, so don't put an infinities into mathematical statements. That's, that's the, the key. Now, I've just shown you some absurdities that we get in trouble with sometimes. I want to, want to avoid the, the silly stuff. Now, overall, most people are doing a pretty good job on the quiz. I do want to remind people on problem number one, the first problem, the one error, other than you know some interesting integration, because the question involved, let's see, we were doing one over the cube root. So my graph looks something like this. That's two and I want you know, 29. I want this area right here. So this is an improper integral. Uh, I'll use I'll use t. Okay, go ahead, run mute yourself, please. It's really loud at my end. Tell me what is not quite correct about this statement. Don't look at the key. <laughs> We're looking at the one-sided limit, not the. Two-sided limit. It's a one-sided limit. You see, if I approach two from the other side, it actually changes things. It, it there's there's no other side. It might not seem like life and death, but that actually really is important. That I, which side I'm approaching. It's a one-sided limit, and if there was a common error, it was simply forgetting that. Now that's not life and death, but it does it does matter because the other side doesn't exist, which would mean if I put a two and not a two from the right. The answer actually is D and E because there is no limit on the other side. Oh, one-sided limits always exist if they're in the domain. But if I don't put a one-sided limit, then it has to be the same from both sides and the limit from the other side, we don't have. So that's a, that's a minor thing, but it's something to be aware of, that's all. Now, today we are going to use integration, but I have to set up, I don't want to say artificial conditions. I have to set up conditions that allow us to consider an integration. Now consider the following sum. I have the sum, let's say from n equal one to infinity of a n. Okay, I know that's a one plus a two plus a three and so on, but we're going to say that the a n's themselves are all greater than or equal to zero, meaning I have no negative terms. That's artificial. You're never ever restricted by positives and negatives. And we're gonna find that the majority of all series actually alternate from positive to negative. But in this situation, first thing we're gonna do is assume that all of our terms are non-negative, okay? Um, I don't necessarily have to have them getting smaller. I just have to have them being non-negative. But next thing is we're also gonna make the assumption that each term is getting smaller. Because remember, if my terms are not getting smaller, then I failed the nth term test. And so I've already diverged. So I'm done with the problem. If either condition, if that the limit isn't zero of the individual term or that I'm not getting smaller, if either one of those conditions fails, the limit, you're done, it diverges. It's not an interesting question. So we're gonna assume that not only are the terms getting smaller and approaching zero, okay, they're all non-negative. And so what that does, is if I thought of this from a graphic standpoint. Now, I did some really nice drawings. If you, if you look online under the notes section, if you look at this particular one, you'll see some, some nice drawings. I actually used a, a little grid. I'll show you. Uh, had one of these little things, and I drew pictures on this and then took pictures of it, so it would be far more accurate than my, than my drawings. But let's just suppose Okay, there's one, two, three, four. We, here's the situation. I'm going to actually, in a sense, kind of like plot points. So let's say A1 is whatever this value is. That's just some positive value. It could be one, it could be 1,000, it doesn't matter. But A2 is a little less and then A3 and then A4 and, A4, and so on. My terms are getting smaller and 
Of course, they're approaching zero. That's what's happened. They're getting smaller and they're approaching zero. I should probably make them get smaller less fast so you can see them, all right? So this is what we have. I'll make it like this. Now, does this converge or diverge? I don't know. There's, there's a lot of different ways I can tell. But if I thought of this in terms of what, what about the area? Well, if I said take that height and add it to that height and add it to that height and add it to that height and so on, that's what I'm actually doing here. But in the sense of like a, a curve, imagine if I just connected the dots. And I thought of this like a curve and I said, what if I just think of this as area under the curve? Would the area under the curve, remember there's, there's space between the dots, but would the area under the curve equal this sum? No, it wouldn't, but it would be absurdly close. And I'm gonna prove that to you. The area under the curve would be very close to the sum of the heights. So if I thought of this from an integration standpoint, maybe I can do an integral to determine if this is, if this is gonna be the same or converge or diverge really. So there's two ways I can look at this. First off, if I said, let's make a rectangle. Let me erase my curve now, because I want you to see this. Again, I have better pictures online. Let me just do the first few terms. Boom, 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 boom. So if I made this one. Okay, these are supposed to be straight. You kind of get the idea. So let me make a rectangle. The, remember that I'm going from one to two. So this has a width of one and its height is A1. So what is the area of this rectangle? Call this area one is equal to A1. Whatever that height is, that's exactly the area of that rectangle. Well, what about the next rectangle? Oh. Call that A2, if you will. That is just, oops, that is just A2. And so on. If I just simply square these off, then clearly the area of the rectangle is equal to the individual values. So I can make this sum into an area. Now, it's not a curve yet. It's a bunch of rectangles, but there's nothing wrong with this. So this concept of, let me just keep going, you know. <clears throat> Now, what about the curve itself? What did the curve look like? Well, the curve was going through the dots. But whoops, if I did this well, the curve is going through the dots. I'm not doing a very good job of this. So that's that dot. I'm sorry. Um, uh, So if I do the dots, make it easier. The dots are the corners, sorry. I'm trying to make this really, really easy to see. Actually, I've got this one in the wrong place. This should be straight across this way. Okay, I'm, 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 I've, I've messed up where my lines are. Let me make that easier to see. Boom, 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 there we go. Boom, boom, and so on. If I'm going through the dots, now you can see it probably clear. My curve is always a little bit below the rectangles. Again, I hope that's easy to see. When I squared this off, the height of this rectangle and the area under the curve, the rectangle is going to be slightly above the area under the curve. So if we said, let's call f of n the curve. So f of one would be, in that, in that case, then f of one would equal a one, f of two would equal a two and so on. But f of n would be the curve. So I could have f of a half and f of you know, three fourths, things like that, uh, or you know, f of pi. As I'm going down, clearly the summation is a little bit bigger than the integral. Now, what would the integral be? The integral would be f of n dn, if it really makes you comfortable, right? F of x dx. That's not going to change anything. From what to what? Well, from one 
to infinity. So clearly that's an improper integral. And the other thing I want you to notice is it's always going to be a little bit smaller than, whoops, it's going to be a little bit smaller than the sum. Again, because when I make these rectangles, the rectangles are always going to be slightly above the curve. Okay. Now, if I look at this, wouldn't this be the exact same thing as just, just for the heck of it? Isn't this the same as n equals two to infinity of a n plus a one? So this says go a two, a three, a four, a five, a six, and then I'm going to add a one for no really good reason, but I want you to notice that because now I'm going to make a different picture. Same dots. The same dots that I just had a moment ago. So on. But this time, I'm going to go backward on my rectangles. So. Remember, before I went forward on my rectangles, now I'm going to go backwards on my rectangles. And so on. Well, this height right here is a one, but this height here is a two. Okay, this height is a two, this height is a three, and so on. And now if I look at the curve, okay, you notice this time all of my rectangles are below the curve. Hmm. So this time the integral is bigger than the sum if I start at one. So in other words, I'm excluding a one. This height is a one. But if my curve starts here, then I'm really starting with a two. Oh, so that means that the integral is bigger than, now check that out. Ah, oh, so, the integral is between the sum without the first term and the entire sum with the first term. Now, a1 is finite. a1 is just some number. I mean, it might be one, it might be 10, it might be a half. Ah, so here's what I've just shown you with my picture. With this assumption, which is true, my, my terms are getting smaller, otherwise I would fail the nth term test, and all of my terms are non-negative. If my terms alternate in sign, I can't do what I'm doing here. So with this assumption, I have just shown you that the integral is between the entire sum and the entire sum missing the first term. So now what I want to do is say, what about the sum itself? I want it in an inequality. So let me erase this. And let me use this inequality right here. OK. This statement right here says that the sum is smaller than the integral, but the integral, notice, where's the integral? The integral is smaller than this plus a1. So if I throw the a1 on both side, uh, on the other side, then what I'm going to get is, um, okay, yeah, so this guy here, I want to, oh, sorry, let me, I'm, I, mean, I have to race. I hate to do that, but I, I can't fit all this in here. Let me do this again. Okay, let me write the first thing we had here. So the first thing we had was the sum n equal two to infinity of a n was smaller than the integral from one to infinity of f of n dn, and that's smaller than one to infinity of a n. Okay, that was the first thing. This was the whole thing. This was the whole thing, excluding the first term. So now what I want to do, I want to get this guy in the middle. So I do know without question, there we, go. we have this statement right here. That's not in question. We have that. So now look at this here. If I add a one, to both of these terms, if I add the first term, then this is back to here, and this would be the, 
This would be basically this plus the first term. Okay, little clever mathematics. What I just did was I said, let's add A1. I just want to look at this thing. Let's add A1 to both of these. Now this is the entire sum and the entire sum is smaller than the integral plus the first term. So we've just come up with a way of bounding this. Now, this is the thing I'm trying to figure out if it converges or diverges. Does the sum converge or does the sum diverge? If these original conditions hold, then I can make my conclusion using integration. Now, this is not my favorite approach. This is actually the approach you want to use the least often, but when you use it, it's because nothing else worked. If this is finite, then this is finite and this is finite because I'm only adding a finite number. If this is infinite, then both of these are infinite and I'm just adding a finite number. Meaning in simple English, the behavior of the integral and the behavior of the sum are the same in terms of convergence or divergence because the summation is between the integral and the integral plus the first term. And that term is always finite. Hmm. So we have a way of testing a sum by using integration. And we have a really, really clever name for this, this form of testing and uh, a summation using an integral. It's called the integral test. Yeah, because that was the best we could come up with. We, you know, I, I wanted to come up with a really cool name, you know, the, the alpha test, you know, just something, the Avengers test. No, it's the integral test. So let's do an example of the integral test. All right, now let's take a series where we already know its behavior. We know the behavior of the harmonic series. All right, we know what this does. We already know this one diverges, but let's use the integral test to see what happens. So now I'm gonna do the integral from one to infinity. Now it's one over N, dn, but a lot of folks just don't like that. They go, I don't want to integrate with n's. I want to integrate with x's. Does it really matter what letter of the alphabet you integrate with? No, because your final answer is not going to be a function. Your final answer is going to be a value. So if you just really don't like the way that looks, then do this. It's going to be the same final answer. So first thing I'm going to do is address this infinite limit. Now we know what the answer is because we've already done this problem before. And this is one to T. So this is, and this will be the natural log of the absolute value of X from one to T. And that will be the limit as T goes to infinity of natural log T minus natural log one. Well, I know natural log one is zero. As T grows without bound, Log moves rather slowly, but log does grow without bound. So this limit is infinite. Now we already knew that this diverged to infinity, but now we just discovered it a, a different way, okay? But before we did it using summations and being really clever, turns out this was probably a little bit easier. Hmm. Now I mentioned the other day that Without showing you, I mentioned that this guy, I believe I even told you this guy converges. Can I show that using this? Yeah, we're gonna show that using the integral test right now. Okay, similar problem. Now, this is not equal to the integral. There's a tendency people wanna say this equals this. No, actually it would never be true that they're equal. It's not possible because the first term of this series is gonna be a one. That means that this is between the integral plus the number one and the integral, but it's not equal. There's strict inequalities that I set up. I don't need the final value. I just need to know, does it converge or diverge? And as I mentioned last time, if I find out that it converges, I can use technology to help me determine what it converges to, but I'm more interested in the convergence versus the divergence because if it diverges, there's no point in using technology. It diverges, it, it isn't finite. So in this case here, this is the limit as t goes to infinity of one to t of one over x squared dx. And that will equal the limit 
as t goes to infinity of negative one over x from one to t. Okay. This will be negative one over t plus one. Now, as t grows without bound, this is a transient term. And I like this kind of scratch work. As t grows without bound, that approach is zero. Don't write it's one over infinity. That's a terrible answer. One over infinity would be a constant. <laughs> and one over infinity is not zero, period. You gotta, guys got to get that out of your vocabulary. Whoever showed you that, well, they were trying to get your money. Okay, that limit is zero. So overall, this is one. This sum, excuse me, this integral converges to one. Therefore, this sum converges. What does it converge to? I'm not sure. Actually, I do know what it converges to, but I'm, let's pretend I'm not sure what it converges to. But here's what I can say with certainty. It's between what and what? It's between the integral and the integral plus, what is the first term of this? The first term of this would be the number one, one over one squared. I can say with absolute certainty, I don't know what the, this sum is, but it's between one, the value of the integral, and one plus one, which was the first term. That I can say with certainty. Now, to say the, the sum is somewhere between one and two is not very good if I need to know exactly what the sum is. Now, I actually do know exactly what this sum is, but this sum is comp computed using some very complicated mathematics. It's kind of cool, but this sum, believe it or not, is pi squared over six. <laughs> now, pi is really close to root 10, believe it or not. So pi squared is really close to 10. So this sum is really close to 10 and six or five thirds, which of course is between one and two. I do not need to know what the sum is. I just need to know that it converges. So that begs the question. The harmonic series diverged, one over n squared converges. Now, remember when we were talking about sequences before, and in fact, we were doing improper integrals before. Remember, we determined the line in the sand for when, let me rewrite this as, one over n to the p. Remember, we did this before. We didn't do the sum. What we did before was the integral. We did this integral before. Now, I'm not going to do it again. You, you should have it in your notes from a couple weeks back. But we showed the following. We showed that this, if you remember, it equaled something. OK? What did it equal? Um, it equaled one over one minus P when P was greater than one. And it was infinity when P was less than or equal to one. Okay, if you want to go, go back and look in your, in your notes, uh, we did this before. This was a very powerful thing when we were doing the improper integrations recently. We showed this was always true. Oh, so I can go to here and say, if this p is greater than one, the integral is going to converge. So if this p is greater than one, this, this series converges. I don't even have to actually integrate it. If this p is less than or equal to one, then this sum diverges. And that's one of the most powerful results we're going to have. You don't actually have to integrate that one. You now know this based on this statement right here, based on the fact of what this integral does we now know that this guy right here will converge if p is greater than one. It will diverge technically to infinity if p is less than or equal to one. Therefore, we have a really, really clever name for any summation, any series that looks like this. We call this a p series. Any series that's simply one over n to a power, we call it a p-series. And the value of p will tell us whether it converges or diverges. And again, how do I know? Because using the integral test, we know the value of this integral. We've done it before, okay? So there's no ambiguity there. It's kind of cool, all right?
So let's do another one using the integral test. Now the integral test is generally considered the most challenging test for a couple of reasons. Well, one, right off the bat, you have an improper integral. You have an infinite limit. And secondly, is that I'm only going to use this test if it's nasty enough that I can't use something else, which means I pr it probably is going to involve logarithms and, and other nasty things. You know, so I'm probably going to have to do an integration by parts of an improper integral. And yikes, there's just enough evil tube there. All right, let's consider the following sum. n equal 1 to infinity, 1 over 1 plus n squared. Okay. Now, what is the behavior of this guy? Well, then is one, then I'm one over two, then I'm one over five, then I'm one over 10, right? These are gonna get small, they're approaching zero. If you do wanna do the nth, nth term test, that's always correct. I take the limit as n goes to infinity, that's zero, and then I can show each term's getting smaller. But you don't do the nth term test to show it passes the nth term test. You only do the nth term test if you think it's gonna fail. Because if you fail the nth term test, you're done, it diverges. So let's use the integral test. Let's consider the integral from one to infinity. Now, do I always start at one? Well, I'm starting at one because that's a one. Let's suppose that was a seven or a 13 or a 25. Well, then that's where this would start. But we already know that the starting point does not affect convergence or di divergence. We proved that one already. So one over one plus X squared DX. Let's consider this guy. So this is gonna be the limit as t goes to infinity of one to t of one over one plus x squared dx. And I recognize that's inverse 10. Okay, and this therefore is inverse 10 of t minus inverse tan of one. Now inverse tan of one, I know what inverse tan of one is. That's just pi over four. Now, this is what in the quiz, I, I got a lot of people tell me it's the inverse tangent of infinity, but that's not actually possible to take the inverse tangent of infinity. Now, we did this problem last class. I was surprised that anybody had trouble with this one. We actually showed this limit last day. If you look in your notes, I even did it graphically and everything. This limit, the limit is pi over two. I can't plug an infinity over there because the tangent of pi over two isn't infinity. The tangent of pi over two does not exist. There can't be an inverse tangent of infinity. There can't be. Because you can't take the tangent of any angle and get infinity. <laughs> so what do I get in the end? I get pi over two minus pi over four is pi over four. Does that mean that this sum is pi over four? No, because the integral is finite and converges, we'd say that this sum converges by the integral test. The integral, oops, the integral test. Now we're going to learn exactly five different forms of testing and all of them are a little bit different. So one of the things you always do is that when you've, when you've determined convergence or divergence of your series, you always say convergence or divergence by whatever test you just performed. Because most of the tests are going to involve limits at some point. And the value of that limit, depending on which test you perform, sometimes you'll get a limit of one, which is a great answer. But another time you get a limit of one, it's a terrible answer because of that particular test. Another time a limit of one is completely ambiguous. You can't do anything because of that particular test. So you always indicate what test you performed. In this case here, the integration was finite. Therefore, the series is finite. What does this add up to? I don't know. I would use computer technology. Heck, I would just use a powerful graphing calculator and have it do the first bazillion terms, you know, if that helps. All right, that's the integral test. This is not your favorite. You might think it is, but it's not. Now, the next test is by far the easiest test there is. Now, this has to do with an inequality that I'm going to create, but everything, it's very important that I interpret this one correctly. So imagine, if you will, okay, last year, I made an infinite amount of money last year, and Diego made more than me. Can you make any conclusion on that? 
I made an infinite amount of money, but Diego made more than me. What do you think? Can anybody make a conclusion about Diego? It's more, more than infinity? Oh, wait. No. Nah, that's not more than <laughs> How about I made an infinite amount of money? You think, well, how, how can that be? This is going to infinity. This is always bigger than this. Does that mean that that's going to infinity? Does that make sense? I made an infinite amount of money last year and Diego made more than me. Can't you conclude that Diego made an infinite amount of money? That's the only conclusion that you can possibly make. <laughs> okay, so if I, have, if I have an inequality and I can bound it correctly, hmm, there's two forms of this. So let, let me state this. We know, let's say, that the sum from one to infinity of a n diverges to infinity. We have a series, we know it diverges to infinity. Right? My terms are just getting bigger. It's real easy. Now consider we have a second series. Let's call it the sum bn, a different series. Consider this where bn is greater than or equal to a n for all n after some, maybe from term one, maybe from term 10, from some point on, every term in this series is bigger than every term in this series at some point. This was infinite and all of these terms are bigger. Then this one diverges to infinity. All right. Now, I made an infinite amount of money last year, and Lisi made less than me. Can you make any conclusion at all? No. She might not have even worked last year. She might have made an infinite amount, but she might have made a finite amount. You can't make any conclusion. She's on the wrong side of the inequality, in other words. So I have to bound my function. If I have something that's infinite and I know it, and I take something else that's bigger, then it must also be infinite. But if I take something else that's smaller, no conclusion can be drawn, okay? So that's the first one. Now there's a second how can, how can you say that it's bigger if they're both infinity? Term by term. Every term oh, okay. cool. is finite. I said term by term, they're bigger. Therefore, the sum, oh, okay. I don't say infinity is bigger than infinity. No, 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 no. I'm saying if term by term, oh, okay. bigger than other, the graph I just drew a moment ago, I was trying to look right. like you know, one was exponential and one was a line. The exponential is higher than the line at every point. Therefore, if right. the line's going to infinity, the exponential has to be going to infinity. That's the reasoning I'm, I'm trying to get you guys to see. So now, last year, I made a finite amount of money, a positive finite amount of money. Kai made a finite amount of money. And it, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I made a finite amount of money. Kai made a positive amount of money, but it was less than me. Can you make a conclusion? I kind of gave it away, but I made a finite amount of money. Might've been a bazillion dollars. Kai made a positive amount of money, but it was less than mine. Can you make a conclusion? Also finite. It must also be finite because I bounded it. By the way, you notice I said it had to be positive. Oh, because if I said I made a finite amount of money and Kai made less than me, Kai could have been a really bad gambler and he lost an infinite amount of money last year. See, because negative infinity is less than everything, isn't it? So that doesn't work unless I bound that one. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. Now, we know, let's say, we know that, boom, converges to positive value, let's just say L. It converges to some positive value. And we know for this guy here that BN is less than or equal to AN, but greater than or equal to zero, non-negative. 
if we're all in after a certain point. At some point, every term in this series is smaller than every term in this series, but not negative. Then, this converges. What does it converge to? I don't know. Again, we can use technology to do that. Ah, so last year I made a finite amount of money. I made a finite amount of money and Joshua made more than me. Conclusion? I made a finite amount of money and Joshua made more than me. What do you think? Either I made a finite or infinite amount of money. So can you make a conclusion? No. No. Wrong side of the inequality. So does everybody see? I have to bound things the correct way, but bigger than infinite is infinite. Smaller than finite and positive is finite. But bigger than finite, I don't know. Smaller than infinite, I don't know. I'm on the wrong side. But if I can get on the right side, then the conclusion is trivial. Now, and this one, this is by far the easiest test, but probably the test you get to do the least often because the conditions won't always be there. This is called the direct comparison test, which we usually just abbreviate. I don't, you guys do, because you hate writing things out. The DCT, the direct comparison test. So, <clears throat> Let's do a problem we just did. Let's consider we just did this one a moment ago. We already know what the answer is. But I want to do this one using the direct comparison test. So I want to compare it to a series that I know already converges. I, by the way, generally speaking, when you're looking at a series, you'll often have a pretty guy, good idea. Hmm, I think that one's going to converge. Therefore, I'm going to choose a series to compare it to. I think that's going to diverge. I'm going to choose the appropriate series. I have no idea. Well, then we're in trouble. <laughs> but I see that N squared on the bottom. So what I'm going to do, and this is, you always do this the same way. I say, compare to this series, which is a convergent P series. That's all I need to say. Because that two right there, I know it's not only a P series because its form is one over n to a power, but it's a convergent P series because that exponent is greater than one. I'm going to compare this series to this known convergent series. Okay, that's the key. I'm comparing to something that I already know what it's doing. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start term by term. Is it true that 1 over 1 plus n squared is smaller than 1 over n squared? Is that true or false? Stare at that for a minute. Bigger denominator. Now, I needed this to be non-negative, so I'm also going to do that. Ah. So this is between zero and one over n squared, and that's true for all n greater than or equal to one. This is always true. There's never gonna be a time when that statement's not true. Now, technically this is true for all real numbers, but my sum starts at one. So from the first term on, this guy is smaller than this guy and it's bigger than zero, okay? If we agree with that, if term by term I have the inequality, then the sum, from I equal, excuse me, from n equal one, from n equal one to infinity of one over one plus n squared is less than the sum of one over n squared. You can always do this, by the way. When you've shown term by term that one series is bigger or smaller than the other, then you can say that the series themselves are bigger or smaller. Because this is true, this is true. Okay. And I don't, I've already got the bounded by zero. I don't really need to say it again. So I have just proved this was finite, this is finite, positive, and smaller. Therefore, this converges by the direct comparison test. Beautiful.
all right? We like this one, there was no algebra. I just had to be alert enough and be aware, hey, these guys are smaller than these guys and I know these guys converge. All right, let's try another one. And keep it simple. <clears throat> I want to consider, and how about, um, hmm. Oh, that one looks so complicated. Hmm. Well, first of all, you think this converges or diverges? Anybody want to try it? What do you think? Converge or diverge? You just had to make a wild guess. You know, you're gonna. I would guess know. it converges. Why? Because the denominator grows more quickly than the numerator, so it seems like it might. The terms might be heading towards zero. Oh, they definitely, the, the limit of the terms is definitely zero. Yeah, because the degree of the numerator is smaller. What if I wrote it like this? What if I broke it up? Isn't this one over n plus three over n squared plus five over n? Is that true? And don't we know that the sum of one over n diverges? Oh. Okay, it will pass the nth term test. Does everybody agree? So here, I'm gonna give you the insight. This one's going to diverge. It's not obvious, but it's gonna diverge. But all you really have to look at here, believe it or not, all you really had to look at was the degree difference. Uh, sorry, that's hard to read now. The numerator has a degree difference of exactly one, which means that as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this thing's gonna behave like one over n. Oh, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to compare to this guy. A divergent. Now you can say it two ways. You can call that a P series because technically it is a P series, or you can be specific and say harmonic series. I'm going to say di divergent harmonic series. Now, I believe that term by term, all of these are bigger than all of these because of the extra terms in the numerator. That's important. So I believe that n squared plus 3n plus 5 over n is bigger than 1 over n. In fact, for every number from 1 to infinity, every number, that's true. Oh, okay, so that would be true. Every one of these is bigger than every one of these forever. Therefore, the n cubed, right? Did I lose? Oh, thank you, thank you, yes. Yes, that, that should be cubed, sorry. Every one of these is bigger than every one of these forever because I showed you when I expanded it because I have all the extra terms on top. Therefore, the sum of these must be bigger than the sum of these and the sum of these was already infinite. It's like saying this one gets to infinity, you know, five minutes earlier, I guess. I don't know. Therefore, n squared plus three n plus five over n cubed diverges by the direct comparison test. And I, I'm quite happy with the abbreviating that. Cool. So when yeah. you're comparing, when you're comparing uh, like which side to put the inequality on, it's quite literal. Like if you were to plug in one, if you were to plug in two, if you're, is that what you're saying? Well, yep. Yeah. And, and the way you knew that is when I broke this up the first time, these terms right here are always positive. So one over n plus this stuff is always bigger than one over n. Do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. That's why I said starting at one. Now let me throw a what if. What if that had been like a minus five instead of a plus five? Oh, then I might have had to go out two or three values before it was bigger. You see, 
But if that had been a minus, then when n was one, this would be negative. And then when n is two, it'd be four plus six plus, uh, if that had been a minus, it'd be minus. I, I might've had to wait a little while, but, but I think these would have exceeded them. Okay, that's why you always make the statement and hopefully the algebra isn't such that, all right, it doesn't happen till the 27th term, but it does happen eventually. That does happen sometimes, but don't, don't sweat that one. That's kind of an outlier. So the integral test is because I have something I can actually integrate. If you can't integrate it, you don't do the integral test. That'd be a bad idea. Direct comparison is I see an obvious comparison because the way it was stated, it's just, it's just right there in front of me. I don't have to do any work. But now what if it's not quite right? What if it's just, just a little bit off? I'll give you an example. You know this converges, it's called a converging P-series. If I put N squared plus two, you'd go, oh, I'm gonna do a direct comparison. This is kind of a no brainer. I'm gonna do a direct comparison because every one of these is smaller than every one of these. Every one of these is positive and piece of cake. Do you all agree that would, that would be piece of cake? We've already done it. How about that one? Houston, we have a problem because every one of these is bigger than every one of these. I made a finite amount of money last year and Joshua made a little bit more than me. I, I'm thinking that he made a finite amount, but maybe he made an infinite, I'm not sure. Wrong side of the inequality in other words. So now we're gonna get to the third and the most powerful of the three tests. And one that can almost always be used in place of the other two. You want the other two because if they apply, they may be the ones you're supposed to do. If I can do a direct comparison, I'm always gonna do that one, that's just easier but I may not be able to do that one. So now we have to look at something else. And we're gonna look at what we call the asymptotic convergence, okay? And this is really important. This is, again, getting into the transient terms and other things. We know that when we have rational functions, and right now that's really all we're thinking of is, is rational functions. You know, polynomials on top and bottom, maybe the square root of a polynomial at the worst, but what is it acting like? So if I said, let's, let's keep it simple, I think just regular stuff. If I had something like this, I have um, 2x cubed minus 6x over you know, 5x to the fourth plus 3x squared plus 9. And I said, what does this look like? Well, is it legal for me to multiply top and bottom? Is it legal for me to do something like this? Yeah, as long as x isn't 0, I can always do this. And now my numerator would be two over X minus six over X cubed. My denominator would be five plus three over X squared plus nine over X to the fourth. These are equal for all real numbers in the domain except for zero. So if I said, now as X is getting bigger and bigger, what is this looking like? You'd say, well, this is tending towards zero. I, I know that it's tending towards zero. So that's, that would be absolutely correct. But that's less useful for me to know that eventually it's gonna disappear into the x-axis. Now, the rule was always you take the higher degree and you do that. But in what we're doing, we actually wanna take the lower degree. This time we wanna do the lower degree and I'll show you why. Okay, when I'm doing the limit to infinity, you always do the higher degree. There's no exception. You would never get the right answer if you did it any other way. But the fact that this is gonna disappear into the x-axis isn't my goal. So I'm gonna take the smaller degree and now it's two minus six over X squared. My bottom's gonna be five X plus three over X plus nine over X squared. Now as X gets bigger and bigger and bigger, we know these guys are transient terms. Why is that important? Because what does this look like? I don't have to go out very far. What does this start looking like? So we can say this is asymptotic, not equal, never equal, because these are never zero. But you know, if I replaced x with 100, these would be insignificant. If I replace x with 1,000, this is looking like this. This is asymptotic to this. And another way of thinking about it, if I graph this on my graphing calculator, 
and I graph this on the graphing calculator. Yes, they're both disappearing into zero, but what's really happening is the curves are becoming one to the naked eye. It becomes very difficult to distinguish this one from this one in a very short time. So as they're moving on, it's the behavior of the curve. So this is the next test. It's of this concept that we have two, we have two things again. I know, I know this converges or diverges. In all likelihood, this is probably a P series for the next test. It's probably almost every time I'm going to be doing comparisons to P series. Okay. And I believe, and that's the key, I believe, whoops. has similar behavior. Another way of saying that I believe they're asymptotic in nature. Okay. Then if the limit as n goes to infinity of the quotient or, by the way, because it does not matter which way you go. Doesn't matter which one's on top. If the limit of that quotient is finite, not zero. Okay, so I took the limit, I got two thirds, I did this way, I got three halves. I did this way, I got 25, I did it this way, I got one over 25. You're gonna get the same thing. I got a limit that was finite, but not zero. See, if I get a zero in one direction, that means that they, I picked the wrong thing. Because in the other direction, right, it's gonna grow without bound, I picked the wrong thing. If I get a limit that's finite and not zero, then first of all, these are asymptotic. So the conclusion is they both converge or diverge together. So if this one diverged and this limit was constant and not zero, okay, then they're both going to diverge. If this one converged and this limit was finite and non-zero, then they both converge together. In fact, they're going to act like they're constant multiples of each other, quite literally. And so this is called the limit comparison test. And affectionately, the LCT. Direct comparison and limit comparison are the only ones you actually use initials for just because you we get tired of writing all those words. So Mr. Brown, when you say has similar behavior, do you mean like we just did to show that asymptotic behavior? Absolutely. But in this case, um, that's exactly what it is. But in this case, we're going to take a direct quotient. So the problem that I just did, when I said it, it behaves like one over five X, if I had taken the original function and put it over one over five X or vice versa, that limit would have been constant. We would have actually gotten a limit of one. So let's, right. let's actually do a couple of examples so you can see how this works. This one here is probably going to be the one you use the most likely for this, these types of things. So let's consider the following. How about, um, oh, heck, let's do one we've already done. Let's do that one. We're getting used to this one. We've done the integral test. We've done the direct comparison. So what do I think this acts like? I think this acts like the sum of one over n squared. Because... You know, as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, that one is going to be kind of insignificant, isn't it? You know, if I replace n with a bazillion, a bazillion squared plus one isn't much different than a bazillion squared. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare, and I do it the same way I do the direct comparison. I say compare to this a convergent p-series. Okay, so here's how it works. I actually now forget the sum. I'm looking at the individual terms. We're going to take the limit as n goes to infinity, and it never matters which one you put on top. It never matters. But most people, most people will just go ahead and opt to put the one you're testing on top 
because if I put that one on the bottom and I start manipulating, I, I can mess it up really quickly. I, I can actually make mistakes unintentionally. So most folks just go ahead and put this one on top. It never matters. So this is equal to what? The limit as n goes to infinity of n squared over one plus n squared when I flip that over. And that limit is what? Anybody? One. It's just one because of the degrees are they're the same. In this case, one is the most beautiful answer I could possibly get for a limit because it means they are quite literally acting identically. They're acting exactly the same. If I drew the graph of one over one plus x squared and I drew the graph of one over x squared, they disappear into each other almost immediately. Forevermore, they, they're acting as if they're exactly the same thing. Okay, because the ratio of, of, of the terms is simply one. It's beautiful, beautiful. So we've just proved, by the way, this converges three different ways. And now I say, therefore, uh, sorry, one plus, therefore this converges by the limit comparison test. Now we're gonna do a, a few more of these so you can kind of get the hang of it. Because sometimes knowing what to compare it to is the only part that you have to think about. Now, where since this is primarily for rational functions, by the way, th this won't work if I have an exponential function. This won't work if I have a factorial, which are going to be the most common types of problems coming up. That's, but that's, well, you got to wait till Wednesday for those guys. Let's consider the following. Oops, n, not, sorry, not x. Oops, try that again. I'd like to know the behavior of this guy. So now look at the degrees. You see a degree difference of one. That means you should be choosing to compare it to a P series. Which P series though? There's only a degree difference of one. What should I compare it to? See, this had a degree difference of two and I compared it to one over n squared. One over n. One, one over n. One over n. Exactly. The degree difference tells me exactly what I should choose to compare it to. A divergent. And again, if you said P series or you said harmonic series, it does not matter because you're correct on both counts. The har harmonic series is one very, very special P series, in other words. Okay, so I believe that the behavior of this guy is going to be similar to the behavior of this guy. I believe that because of the degree difference, but I have to prove it by taking the limit. So I want the limit as n goes to infinity, and I'm going to put this guy on top just so I don't run the risk of miswriting it, or in my case, losing exponents. Now I'm going to show you where you can be a little bit lazy. Divided by 1 over n times what? n. Or, or if you want to just do that, times n. Everybody understand? I just saved myself a step of writing. I'm dividing it by 1 over n, which is the same as that. Totally legal. Now, when I do this, if I did this right, here's what must happen exactly 100% of the time. My resulting quotient, if I did this step correctly, my resulting quotient, tell me something about my resulting quotient. Four over six. No, 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 my quotient, not, not the limit. Oh, this sorry. Way. They'll have the same um, lead exponent term? Yeah, they're the same degree. They're the same degree. If I did it right, absolutely, they have to be the same degree. If I compare it to the wrong thing, let's just say hypothetically, I'm, 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 I'm you know, I'm, I'm watching the Laker game and I'm just not paying much attention because that happens, you know, or, you know, a Kings overtime shootout or something. And, and I, I just simply picked the wrong exponent. Then at this stage of the game, they are not going to match which means I'm either gonna get a limit of infinity or a limit of zero, depending on which one was higher. Neither one of those 
are possible answers in a limit comparison. You cannot get zero, you cannot get infinity. Every other answer is fine. <laughs> Those are the only two that means you just totally wrecked the problem. But this answer you said is four over six. What does that mean? That means that this one is acting like it's about four six times as big as this one. That's literally what that means. But because that one's infinite, that one must be infinite. Or because that one diverges to infinity, this one diverges to infinity. Now, I'm going to be lazy with this, diverges. Now, here's where, yes, it is true that it does diverge to infinity. But I'm far more concerned the fact that it diverges. That's, that's really the bottom line. So it's OK to not say to infinity and just say it diverges by the limit comparison test. So this one is asymptotic exactly to 4 6 times this one. Now, you notice I didn't compare it to 4 6 times this. No, no, no. Take the series, 1 over n, 1 over n squared, 1 over n cubed, whatever it is. Take the series as is and compare it. Because all I'm looking for is a finite number that's not 0. I'm not expecting it to be a 1. In fact, if, you're, if there are coefficients involved in general, you're not going to get a limit of 1, but you are going to get a limit that's finite. All right, let's do another one of these. Mr. Brown, so if you were to graph the two of these together and sort of zoom out, you know, very far, would you see then that the one that we were comparing it, the, you know, the 4n squared, not the 1 over n, but the 4n squared part, that would look like about 2 thirds of 1 over n? Exactly. Or a safer way of saying it, what if I took 2 thirds of this one, then they'd look exactly the same. Okay. Great, thank that, you. That's that may, but I'm not going to take two thirds of this one. I'm going to take the one where I know its behavior, and and I'm not expecting an answer of one. I don't need the answer to be one. I just need finite. Now there are textbooks out there. We've used textbooks at Mesa College that actually gave the wrong conclusions for this one. It, some of the like Thomas and some of them, it was horrific that all of the limit comparisons, when you look in the back of the book, they had the wrong answer about half the time. It's as if the author never learned how to do the proper test. Like you can't get the wrong answer. That's All right, let's try another one. We're gonna do just a couple more of these bad boys. So I've got N equal one to infinity. Actually, let me, let me, let me change it up on you. N equals three to infinity, how's that? And equal three to infinity of um, six minus four n squared over um, how about uh, two n to the fourth plus six n minus one. Remember, where you start has nothing to do with where uh, whether it converges or diverges. Where it starts only helps you determine what it converges to if it converges. So, like, if I had a geometric series, I already know what you know how to calculate its convergence. Oh, but if I start at seven, well, then I'm going to converge to a slightly different number. That's the idea. This either converges or diverges. What it converges to, if I'd started at one versus two versus three, I'd get slightly different answers, but that's not even important. I just want to know if it converges or diverges. So anybody want to tell me, what am I going to compare to? One over n squared. And how did you come to that conclusion? Because the, the power difference is two. Exactly. That's it. Please keep it that simple. <laughs> I think you would all agree that that's not, that piece right there is not complicated. Now, why, why do I have to get that right? Because when I do this comparison and I'm looking basically for asymptotic convergence, if I choose the wrong degree, I won't get finite non-zero answers. That's it. That's it's that simple. And that would mean that they're not acting like constant multiples. I need them to act like constant multiples because if I have a finite quantity and I have something else that acts like a constant multiple, then obviously it's finite. If I have an infinite quantity and something else acts like a constant multiple, then obviously it's infinite. That's that's the reasoning here. So we're going to take the limit. And again, I'll put this one on top just because I'm less likely to mess it up if I do it in that order over one over n squared. So if you'd like times n squared over one. We know algebraically that's valid, but I encourage people to do that just because it saves me a step of writing. Now, don't try to cancel. That's too messy. Just go ahead and distribute it. It's so much easier. 
And so we'd have six n squared minus four n to the fourth over two n to the fourth plus six n minus one. And do make sure you distribute correctly. Now, what is the value of this limit? Anybody? Negative two. It's negative two. Is that a good number? That's a great number. It's not zero. <laughs> now, I've seen everything under the sun in, in my time. And I've, I've seen people say, well, yeah, the limit doesn't exist because it can't be negative. Well, why is my limit negative? Because starting with n equal two, every term of this series is negative. <laughs> as soon as I, n equal one, my first term, I'm going to have a six minus four on top. But the moment n hits two forevermore, every term in this series is negative. Therefore, its sum has to be negative. There's nothing wrong with negative. I should get a negative limit. What that means in simple English is that this series is acting like it's about negative two times as big as this series. That's what that means. And if that one's finite, then that one's finite. So I'm gonna put therefore the series, I'm gonna be lazy, converges by the limit comparison test. You. This test is actually very simple to perform, but it's primarily gonna be used on rational functions, or at least algebraic functions. Now, most folks don't realize there's, there's, they're not exactly the same thing. A rational function, as you know, is a quotient of polynomials. And a polynomial is a sum of monomials where every single term has to have a non-negative, I should say a positive integer exponent. Technically, it could be zero. But you can't have roots, for example, in a polynomial. OK, an algebraic function, you can have roots, but you, it could be the root of a polynomial. That's OK. What I can't have is a trig function or a log or an exponential function. Those are called transcendental functions. Every function that exists is either algebraic or transcendental. And if you look up the definition, it's usually cool because it usually says something like if you look up transcendental, it'll say non-algebraic. And algebraic, it'll say non-transcendental, which means you can only know both of them. Excuse me. You can't know either one of them unless you know both of them simultaneously. <laughs> it's it's one of those really bad definitions because there's only two possibilities <laughs> if it's not one it's the other thing but you have to know what each one of them are and i always have fun with bad definitions like that okay so let's take one this is the worst one this is the only one that might give people issues all right let's consider i've got the sum from n equal one of um about 3n minus 6 over the square root of n to the fifth plus 2n minus 1. You have got to be joking. No, nope. there's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, the limit comparison is the only one we could do. And technically, you could attempt to do this using the integral test. I'm not sure I want to use the integral test on that one because I'm not sure I'd be able to integrate that. <laughs> so we're going to do a limit comparison. Now, in the last example, Lisi told us she looked at the top degree terms of numerator denominator, and that was absolutely correct. I have a square root, so technically it's not a degree, but I do know that I can manipulate and factor and do all sorts of crazy stuff with that. So in a sense, can I kind of look at my denominator as n to the five halves? just for purposes of choosing an exponent. Would there be anything wrong with that? I got to pick an exponent. What do you think? Yes. Yeah, another way you could do this. I don't, I don't need you to do this, but we may have to do this at some point anyway. Can I do the bottom? Could I factor out the end of the fifth? Because I want to make sure that you guys believe this. I know I can do, that's my denominator. Ah, uh, and these are transient terms. That means my denominator is asymptotic to this. Because this is one plus a couple of transient terms under the root. My denominator, as n gets bigger and bigger, my denominator is already acting like n to the 5 halves. So for the purposes of choosing the right p-series, I look at the highest degree. On top, the highest degree is 1. This, by the way, I said this is the worst problem. 
This is the worst one. What am I going to compare to? One over n. Pick a power. It ain't going to be one. Is it five halves? Three halves. Three halves. Yeah. Three halves because I have the one on top, and you said five halves on the bottom. So three halves. Perfect. That took a little bit more thought, but when you step back and look at it and go, you know, yeah, if I factor the n out of the top and I factor the n of the five halves out of the bottom, oh yeah, okay. I, eventually you can see that. I don't need you to do any of the algebra I just did. I just need you to look at the highest degree terms again for the purposes of what I'm comparing it to. So now I am making the bold claim that I believe this thing is acting like at least a constant multiple of this thing. And why do I say a constant multiple? Because I don't think my limit's going to be a one because of the coefficient, but I believe it's going to act like a constant multiple of that guy. Now, the proof will be when I take my limit and I get a finite constant, then I know I did it right. If I take my limit and I get infinity or I get zero, then I know that that's, that was a poor choice. That's all that means. I don't force it to work at that point. So let's take the limit as n goes to infinity of 3n minus 6 over the square root of n fifth plus 2n minus 1 divided by that, or if you want times n to the 3 halves. Great. Okay, now I really do have to do that factoring thing I did a moment ago. There's no way around it. You can't, even if I distribute on top, there's nothing to cancel, and you can't use degree in the argument when you have a root. But we've done problems of this nature before, So my numerator, I'm going to write as 3n to the 5 halves minus 6n to the 3 halves, okay? My denominator is still just this. I haven't done anything yet. Boy, there's a couple of different things I can do. I could actually factor the top. But if I factor the top, it's the five, the end of the five halves that I would want to factor. And I could factor the bottom. I know I could do that and I could cancel. I could multiply top and bottom by one over end of the five halves and then work it into the root. That one for a lot of folks is less comfortable. That, that might feel a little bit iffy. So let's do this. Okay, let's go ahead and factor the top. We, we can't fudge this. We know where this is going, but we have to use correct algebra. So I have end of the five halves times. Now on the top, I'd have three minus six over n. There's my numerator. On the bottom, we just did it a moment ago, and I'll do it again. n to the fifth, one, two over n to the fourth, minus one over n to the fifth. Okay, so when I factor that out, that's gonna be n to the five halves square root, one plus two over n to the fourth, minus one over n to the fifth. Not our favorite problem, but I think at this point we all realize, oh, this is going to work out very friendly. Different color one more time. I can't, I can't evaluate yet. It's still infinity over infinity. But when I rid myself of those pesky end of the five halves, uh, can I evaluate this limit? Yes, transient term, transient term, transient term. What is the value of this limit? Three. Three. In simple English, this series, with converge or diverge, this series acts like it's three times as big as this series. That's, it is, is it equal to exactly three times as big? No, but if I had the ability to do the calculation, it would probably be really close, you know, maybe, you know, 2.97 times as big or, you know, 3.01, I don't know. It, it's essentially three times as big. Now, that's finite, it's not zero. Oh, I, I left something out. Now, here's the most common mistake. All right, therefore the series blank by the limit comparison test. My blank, it's either converges or diverges. Can I actually make a conclusion right now? Can I make one right now? Why can't I make a conclusion? My conclusion has to absolutely match what I compared it to. What did I forget to write down? What did I forget to write down? I have something in my eye. 
I forgot to write down the behavior of the thing I'm comparing it to. Not a good idea. I can't make a conclusion here because I never said what's happening here. The conclusion I make here absolutely has to match the behavior of that guy that I compared it to. Oh, so way back here, what should I have completed this statement with? I purposely left it on incomplete. A Which, convergent P series? It, yeah, and by the way, was that absolutely obvious? Three halves, I don't, we haven't done three halves yet. The three halves is bigger than one. The single most common mistake in, in this big picture is flawless mathematics, incorrect conclusion. And that's the killer. Everything right with the wrong conclusion and usually it's because I made a misinterpretation early on. Compared to this, comma, a convergent P-series. Now, I'm comparing it to a known P convergent P-series. I got a finite non-zero limit. Therefore, this has to be, absolutely has to be the same thing. It is not possible mathematically to compare something to a divergent series and conclude converge, to compare to a convergent series and conclude divergent. That's impossible, okay? Can't be done. So I need to state that. Now, how did I know it was convergent again? What was the, because this one's weird. It's a fractional exponent. How did I know? What was the absolute? If the exponent is greater than one, then the P-series converges? That's it. It's, it's that simple. It's one over N to a value that's greater than one. Okay. So that, this is convergent because three halves is bigger than one. That's it. That's the only thing you need to remember. And that's a good one to write down at some point. So that converges finite. This converges. Whatever this converges to, it's roughly three times whatever that converges to. Roughly because they have asymptotic behavior. So uh, going back to Joshua's question earlier, it said, if I wanted to do this graphically and do a comparison, then what I would do is now that I know the behavior, I would graph three over n to the three halves. Then these curves will in fact disappear into each other. This is kind of a cool thing. So if you have a graphing calculator and you're not intimidated from beginning to end, you know, setting up your windows and everything, just a minute. All right, and that's just to say, oh, I see that I see that this is going on. So we now have integral test, direct comparison, limit comparison. You saw a lot of similar algebra. The integral test, often it's the case that you could use one of the comparison tests and you don't have to. I'm never going to say use the integral test. So when would you ever use it? If you've got a logarithm, there is no algebraic test any form that we're going to learn that'll work on in general, in general, on a logarithm, those kind of have to be integrated. There's, there's certain things that just they have to be integrated because there's nothing to compare it to. But I'm always looking to see, can I do a comparison test? Because if I can, I should. So I use the example one over one plus n, n squared. We did that one using the integral test, using direct comparison, using limit comparison. And all of them gave us the same conclusion. Now, I'll tell you right now, the majority of people, if they can do a limit comparison or a direct comparison, the majority of people actually do limit comparisons because you get so used to them and you get so good at them. But a limit comparison still means you have to ultimately take a limit, which means there's some algebra involved. Direct comparison, you're just writing down an inequality and saying it's always true. You got to be right, of course. So the limit comparison is a little bit of work, but it's usually very straightforward. This was the nastiest of all because of the root. Most of the time, it's not a root. Now, remember, on your limit comparison, your limit has to be finite, non-zero. I get a lot of people doing this way. Now, this one always makes me worry. And by the way, I would say in a typical Calc 2 class, half the students will do the following. And this is greater than zero, therefore, I will actually have people say, and I got the limit, and the limit is greater than zero. Therefore, I'm going to give you my conclusion. I know this stuff inside and out. I've helped author multiple textbooks. There is no such thing as a test where you compare your result to zero. I have no idea what that has to do with anything. And I will get people using this as the foundation of their conclusion. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're not comparing anything to zero. No, this was finite and it was not zero. You see, what if this had been a negative three? Just as good. Just meant all those terms would have been negative. That's all. You're never comparing that number to zero, ever. 
<laughs> so yeah, that, be careful with that one. Never, never do that one. That, that, that no work. All right, we're going to take a short break, like always. And when we come back, let's do the whole question thing. Okay.